What is going on, Lunatic Fringe? Today, I'm going to do something a little bit different. No technical analysis. I'm going to be interviewing Rex YZ. If you don't know who that is, he was one of the original founders of the Steering Commission. That Steering Commission eventually became the Terror Rebels. If you've been around for any length of time, you know the Rebels of Legend, Ed Kim, Alex Forshaw, Zeradar. You knew some of these guys, but he Rex YZ left a little bit early, and he moved on and created Terraport.Finance. About a year ago, Terraport.Finance was hacked for the tune of $4 million. Funds they are still trying to recover to this day. And there's a lot of interesting pieces in here to unpack. So I'm going to send this video out in its entirety. It's about an hour and a half long, so there's a lot of information to unpack. Now, if you like this type of content, make sure you hit the like button, the subscribe button, the bell to be notified of future content. And uh, grab yourself a bag of popcorn because you're about to listen to one of the original guys around the Luna Classic system when it collapsed and how they put the pieces back together. And if you listen real close, you might even hear something about a repeg that might be coming a lot sooner than you think. Sit back and enjoy, and thank you so much for tuning in. What is going on, Lunatic Fringe? It's your man, Bleeves, here, and I am here with Rex YC. You may remember this name. You probably know this name if you're involved in Terra Luna Classic. This is one of the OGs that got started way back in the day. Uh, this is an old Terra Rebel original. In fact, I'm pretty sure that this was the guy that kept everybody tight-lipped so that there was only one single voice. So, uh, without further ado, Rex, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. And, uh, you know, thanks for giving us the time to uh, have a chat with you. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, to confirm here, you were one of the original Terra Rebels, along with Ed Kim and Zeradar and Alex Forshaw and some of these other guys, uh, before you broke away and started to take your own lane in the Terra Classic universe. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um I kind of joined Terra Rebels before it was even called Terra Rebels. They were still working out what the what the name was going to be then. Um, and I was part of the steering group, certainly in the early days anyway. Incredible. So, but you left and moved on, and then you got involved in Terra C, Vita or Vita? Do you say, I say Vita. Yeah, I say Vita as well. Um, okay. Yeah. It's, you it's, got it's, into Terra C, Vita? It, yeah, I call it Terra Vita. Uh, with like a silent C, but I write it with a C in, and um, you know, C standing for classic, uh, Terra standing for Terra, um, and Vita standing for life, and that that's what the the name's all about. It's about bringing life to Terra, making Terra a lively place to be, and making sure that it's got a sustainable long life as well. So, uh, so Terra Vita, it's it's more of a mission statement rather than the name of the team, let's say. And that led to uh, Terraport Finance, is that right? That was the yeah, impetus but- for it. Yeah, um, in the uh, the early days when I left um, Terra Rebels, uh, we built a we'd done a kind of bit of analysis on what the chain's needs were, and there's a few elements that we that we thought was crucial to be included in any recovery. And one of those was to be able to um, give developers the opportunity to have their projects kind of traded through their coins, um, native ones to Terra Classic, and the other was to allow an extra way for money to come into Terra Classic as well. Uh, so a DEX seemed to be the the ideal solution to that. Right. And and that's where Terraport.finance came from. And uh, now the governance token there is the cash tag T-E-R-R-A. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, we couldn't have picked a better name for that, could we? It's, uh, we spent a long time trying to think of the name of that token. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, one of the devs said, well, what about this? You know, it's, uh, has it been taken? Um, so, yeah. Uh, so Terra. <laughs> Yeah, that's don't know where it came paper. from, <laughs> <laughs> but it just seemed to fit a tree. Yeah, uh, so, 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 so Terra is the um, the tag, if you like, uh, but Terraport is the actual name of the token. All right, and uh, for those of you that are wondering, uh, th- that we are this is um, uh, you guys are a validator. Let me see if I can pull this up. Um, you are a validator, Terra Vita. And uh, you're you're do you have a ranking? Is there you know, uh, it, were you guys kind of in this whole ecosystem, if you will? Uh, by the way, I did yeah. pull up station for this. Yeah, so I'm not sure what uh, site you're on there, but if you go to uh, validator.info, I think it is, um, and there's various other sites there. I actually just tweeted about this, or or X this, whatever you like to call it, 
um, a few days ago and basically thanked all the um, applications out there and sites uh, where, where we're listed. I think there's about half a dozen. Yeah. So, yeah, validator info, you know, I think that seems to be a popular one amongst the Probably community. number 14? Um, yeah, it looks like we've just gone down one today. So, yeah, 13 or 14 we've been just recently. Yeah, so... Um... But you're, you're, the, the purpose behind what you're doing is in support of uh, Terra Luna Classic and the blockchain. And famously, we all know what happened. We don't have to go rehash that. But tell me a little bit about your early days. What was it like getting into this early on? I, there were names that were kind of out there. There, were, there was Ed Kim, Alex Forshaw, Zeradar, Vegas. There was a bunch of different names that we all kind of saw. And in our frenzy... Uh, some of us, you know, myself, proud D-Gen, uh, we just saw the collapse of an incredible ecosystem through what to, to us, still to this day, really looks like nefarious means from a bad third-party actor, which in my estimation, based on uh, the way lawsuits are playing out right now for Terraform Labs in the United States, was jump crypto trading along with a couple of partners. I want to say that Zach XBT pointed out uh, I want to say Citadel. There was a bunch of different in actors that were involved in the collapse of this entire ecosystem. Um, what fascinated you by, and what got you into this to begin with? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, there's quite a number of things, really. In the absolute beginning, um, <laughs> which was about oh, five or six years ago, something like that, I was sat in the driveway with my son in the car, who was about 15. Um, and he says, Dad, can you give us a couple of grand to buy some Bitcoin? And, <laughs> and I, I said to him, I'd, I'd heard this because, you know, he, he'd been involved with this kind of stuff before. And um, I says, you want me to give you a couple of thousand pounds to buy some Bitcoin? He says, yeah, it's worth something like about $700 at the minute. Or, you know, that gives you, however many years ago, that gives you an idea of how long ago it was. Um, and I said, right. I says, well, I, you know, if I buy this, I says, how do I get my money back out? And we sat in the car, and it wasn't an easy thing to kind of describe them days. And like I say, it was only about 15 bucks. In. So I says, well, Matt, I says, when we can get down to the shop and you can buy some milk and bread with it, I'll be interested. Um, <laughs> yeah, oh, dear. I should have listened to him, shouldn't I? We often have this yeah. conversation now. Um, <laughs> so that originally kind of got me interested. And then as, as things went on, um, as time went on, you know, crypto became more and more um, well-known, if you like. and um in january 2021 uh my eldest son yeah, the bitcoin son if you like um he got diagnosed with a brain tumor and it spread to his spine and it was considered great for by the world health organization and he hadn't got long to live um fortunately he still is he had brain surgery radiotherapy chemotherapy is it it's been a hell of a journey for him um but, but he's still here. It's um, The treatment took away his ability to walk. So he's getting there now. But, but where I guess where this links to this story is that uh, as a 19-year-old, to go through that, you it's very easy to want to give up. And I wanted to show him that you don't give up on something. And at that time, I think it was around about that time, I think it was the, was it the start of the, um, no, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, sorry. At that, at that time, um yeah what's shown that you know you don't give up so there's a couple of things i did and then about a year on um ukraine was invaded by russia and i was thought i was you know i was working out because i gave up work to look after my son and i thought you know if i could just make a bit of money every day um i don't need a lot then you know that'll work out fine for us and i started looking at crypto and i started doing technical analysis and all this kind of stuff um and that's when i became aware of luna so I bought it before um, for the DPEG, for the DPEG I used TC. Um, I didn't spend thousands. Well, I did spend a few thousands, but not tens or hundreds of thousands. Um, and then it started to kind of crash a bit. Um, I didn't think that at the time. I just thought, well, you know, it's volatile. And I bought it all the way down to, <laughs> yeah, literally all the way down to eight zeros. Um, and yeah, and I can remember sat at home in the chair and I did what an Englishman does at half past four in the morning thinking, right now what happens? I went and made a cup of tea. Um, and <laughs> the old and stand by. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, right, crikey. Um, you hear about these things like, you know, Polly Peck back in the day. Um, but I thought, um, 
now what happens? And I, I analysed it. And for about 15 minutes, it was at eight zeros. And then it gradually started to come up and go down. And I thought, hang on, this has been traded. So, you know, I was lucky. I managed to buy back in when it was at six zeros and 56. Um, you could only buy $9 worth at a time then. Um, yeah. So, you know, I kind of pretty much got back what I, what I lost, if you like. Yeah. However, um, just prior to, prior to Luna, what kind of got me really into the crypto was Ukraine being invaded by Russia. Yeah. And I thought I'd got a personal trainer at them days as well. And um, his wife happened to be Russian and she couldn't sell a house because of some kind of restrictions. I think it was to do with the war. However, she could do it through using cryptocurrencies or something like that. And I thought, yeah. this is interesting. This might be where you get mass adoption of crypto. And that's what really kind of got me interested. So those kind of two events kind of together. Um, and then as time kind of moved forward and obviously with it crashed and it started to bounce back a bit, I was watching a lot of YouTube YouTubers, if you like, and reports. And I noticed that the community started to drift off. It became apparent that people thought, well, there's nobody working on this. Um, so are we just basically just throwing money into a hole? So I set out, find, set out trying to work out what was happening. Um, and I teamed up with, you know, uh, somebody in the community and um we we promoted very heavily a a twitter person that time and a youtuber who just kind of started um to get them noticed that if anybody from a development group kind of wanted to get recognized on twitter they'd probably go to this person and we shilled this person endlessly for about two or three weeks um and that was happy catty crypto ironically um <laughs> so there we go i'm not saying you know where's the secret of the you know of where he's kind of got to, but uh, you know, we certainly have. I, it, I don't think he got treble figures as kind of followers back then. I'm not, not too sure, but he certainly was very early on. Um, so yeah, I got. I noticed uh, some of the kind of um, looked a bit like a developer kind of chatting on Twitter with them, and you know, I contacted them, and they ended up, you know, uh, ending up in the middle of the the Terror Rebels kind of Discord server. I've never been on Discord server before. It's you know, I'm like I say used to you know, talking in the boardroom and, you know, the IT department and stuff, they'll do all this kind of kind of thing. Um, so that was quite quite interesting. Um, and what I'd kind of come up with was, I said, look, if there's some developers here, I said, there's some things that they need to address. And one of those things is, nobody knows there's anybody there. So you need to create some kind of Twitter page or, or something to say, look, Terra Classic has been worked on. You know, any problems there have been addressed and it'll just give people a bit of confidence. And I'd kind of developed a, ru a rudimentary kind of business plan. Um, so I guess that's how I ended up being on the steering group. Um, within a few days, maybe a week or so, you know, there was a bit of a vote what, was gonna, what the team was going to be called. And the Terribles was chosen. Um, I must admit, I wasn't a fan of it for a start. But then after a few days, I thought, oh, no, you know, it's um, with, with like a, a marketing hat on. I thought oh, you can do a fair bit with Terribles. So, you know. Um, anyway, it's stuck, and you know. Were you going for were, were you going to go for Terra Empire or Terra Darth Vader's <laughs> or something like that? I mean, everybody yeah. loves the Rebels. Yeah, I'd, um, I can't remember that. It'd be something boring that I was going to come up with. It'd be, yeah. it'd be something logical and boring. It wasn't as passionate as Terra Rebels. <laughs> um, but yeah, but anyway, that um, it went to the vote. It won the vote, and that's why they ended up kind of calling themselves that. Um, but yeah, so. So as part of the steering group, I can't remember how many of us was in there at the time. I think it was about half a dozen. There was um, Raiders, Zarodar, um, myself. Uh, there was Clan, who was uh, basically on the, the Terror Rebels Discord, if you like. Um, and there was another, another couple. I can't remember off the top of my head. So, and that Ed Kim, he wasn't on the steering group. He was basically working away in the lab, so to speak, trying to find solutions. And, and to quite honest, that's what Ed likes. Um, you know, he, although being a, an associate professor, you need to be able to communicate with people, obviously, very well. It wasn't the kind of thing that drove him. And politics was, you know, his nemesis, if you like. Yeah. Um, he just wanted to deliver change. So, so as time went on, there was various kind of votes that was had. Um, you've got people in the community that were trying to rally people around. And, and one of the ways that they were being rallied was through the generation of the burn narrative. And, you know, Vegas was a big, um, a big proponent of that. Um, and, you know, it seemed, at the time, it seemed to be, you know, a reasonable approach to have some kind of burn narrative. I mean, after all, you know, when you've got, what, 
seven trillion lunk. Um, yeah, six point nine trillion at, at the top. Yeah, yeah six point nine nine four. Yeah, it kind of lends itself to burn being quite important in a lot of people's minds. Um, so, you know, there's some reasonable kind of logic there. However, in, let's call it the the developer's lab, um, I don't think really any of the serious developers thought it was a good thing to do. Right. And um, I don't think Ed was a big supporter of it. Um, I don't think Zaradar was, Raider or or virtually any of them. Um, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not a developer kind of from a technical perspective, if you like. Um, but yeah, you know, those in those from more of a technically informed position, you know, they didn't think it was a positive thing to do. However, um, it had been voted in through governance and the view at that time was Terra Rebels should be here to deliver governance and we should be the um, kind of the saviors of governance, if you like, you know. Right, right. So if the community is asked for a burn tax, then that's what we're going to have to try to deliver. And that's how it that's how it came up. Um, so it soon became apparent once it was kind of delivered that it wasn't the best thing for the for the chain. A lot of the promises that was well, alleged promises that was kind of delivered didn't plan out. Um, there were some developers that you know said that at the rate of burns that they'd projected, it could take hundreds, if not thousands, of years to burn Terra Classic down. Um, and there was probably, as time's gone on, we'll probably have them views kind of more justified if you like. Um, however, anybody, you know, I think the original proposal was that Vegas put up, I think, was for it to burn to 10 billion. Yeah. Well, Terra Classic was of so low value, you can have 10 billion in one wallet. As long as somebody's got 10 billion and they don't spend it, well, you're never going <laughs> to, you're never right. going to get yeah. beneath that. So it was right. never realistic. And anybody that would really think about this and, you know, and do some basic maths would soon work out, well, actually, you know, that's, you know, it's, it's a very unlikely thing to ever be ever to be able to achieve. So, um, so there we go. So as time kind of went on, um, there was a lot of discussion about what was good and bad about the burn tax, and should we, should it be raised, should it be lowered, and so on. And various ideas were were tried out. Um, at this point, um, there was a lot of internal strife in the Terror Rebels, and there was people that was kind of vying for, I'm going to say, vying for power. Um, and at one point, I kind of got voted out the the steering group, um, and I'm the kind of person that's I've got a very strong moral compass, and I believe in doing what's what's kind of right. So I was voted out for having an opinion. Or something I can't remember what it was about now. Um, however, I actually got the Twitter account. Um, I kind of set it up, and there was immense amount of pressure put on me to what they said. You know, often the phrase would be "hand over the keys" and this, that, and the other. But I said, "Well, I only hand them over." Once we deliver what the government, what the community has asked for, and at that time it was to re-establish staking um, and to get the burn tax out, and there was there was so much discussion about what people wanted to do with Twitter. And when we was in the steering group, we'd very much agreed that we would go for quality in terms of tweeting rather than quantity. So any tweet that was released had to be agreed through the steering group. And even when I wasn't in the steering group. I was still kind of delivering what they call the, the head of marketing role. Yeah. Um, but I was kind of doing it, you know, by someone else, I suppose you might say. Um, because I was the person that had kind of got all the all the information on the ecosystem and, you know, um, like I said, the Twitter account and various other things. So after a while, it became quite, I'm going to say, a, a bit of a hot place to be. It's You know, some people would use the word toxic, if you like, um, you know, it's, yeah, anyway, that, that's probably the best way to kind of describe it. But, you know, it started out with a lot of really well-meaning people wanting to make a difference. But then I think they kind of felt that they'd reached an element of fame and, and some people wanted to rise to the top. So so what my view was back then was I thought, look, we need to rescue Terra Classic. Um, and there's certain things that need to be done. And part of that was that I thought that the developers would need support. So I came up with Terra Vita as an alternative um kind of group if you like and because um because at that time you couldn't start new validators i'd made an agreement with the previous provider of a, a validator um that you know we kind of rebrand it with our team's um team's name if you like or branding and then the proceeds of that would go to support terror rebels which is you know quite ironic really isn't it as things have panned out um so we set up a registered charity in america 
and the money was going to go from the validator because we thought we'd get you know a fair amount of following um and we'd also created a uh, a shop as well which never really got off the ground but you know that was the intention and the money would go through the charity like i said the charity was registered and then by providing grants to terror rebels we could fund them and that would enable development to continue however it got we, we made this proposal to terror rebels and it kind of got voted out and i think one of the one of the reasons it got voted out was that we didn't want to just give vast amount of money to a group of people we wanted to demonstrate that there's value for money so we said look you tell us what needs to be done on the chain from a technical perspective we'll create a grant for it and then providing you deliver the outcomes that within that grant which will be what you've pretty much set yourself then we can release the payment um so then you know any kind of auditing that we have to go through it'll all be above board and you know it'll help help everybody however that didn't seem to go down very well um which you know i let people draw their own kind of conclusions to that but for me i thought it was a very open and honest way of going about things um you know coincidentally with it, terra classic at the minute we're going for the paper jobs kind of approach um and that's you know it's a bit of tricky patch it's going through at the minute but you know i think that's that's pretty much what i tried to deliver for terra rebels you know what 18 months ago however long it was um but anyway there we go uh so then shortly after that um there was discussion about neblio i think it was at the time yeah, providing yeah. some kind of funding to terra rebels and I didn't agree with this because I thought, well, you know, we should be about Terra Classic, not another chain. And I just saw that as, you know, um, as an approach to kind of take some of the liquidity out of Terra Classic. So it, it didn't sit comfortably with me. And when I asked, you know, a couple in the, the steering group for some evidence um, to do with, you know, Neblio working with us, um, there's nothing forthcoming because it was, it was made out that this was with the blessing of Binance and it was supported by them. But as it turned out, it wasn't. I mean, they ended up sending a cease and desist letter to Terra Rebels for, for something that, you know, wasn't real. Um, so prior to this, you know, I decided I'd kind of had enough, you know, I'd, I'd asked the question, you know, can you give us some kind of evidence to who's supporting this um, from Binance? I said, you know, what are they, you know, a marketing executive? Are they, Let me interrupt uh, to point out that you were right and everybody was right in their concern for Neblio. Neblio has a two hundred thousand dollar market cap right now, with forty thousand dollars in trade volume, ranking them outside of the top two thousand cryptos. Yeah, well, there you go. It wasn't very good, um, uh, very good coin to kind of partner up with, was it? It, it, it just never added up in the first place. Um, but like I say, risk management is kind of my background, and I ask lots of questions, and due diligence is really important to me. And, and when, and when you ask somebody a very open question and a very easy question to answer and they don't that raises alerts for me so you know i said if you you know i said to vegas and i think it was raider at the time so look can you tell me if you can't tell me who it is that you're dealing with with binance who's suggested this you know who's kind of um pushing nebulo to um kind of sponsor terror rebels yeah can you give us an idea of their status you know was it a was it a director was it a marketing executive i said you know was it manager? Was it the janitor? I mean, you know, <laughs> who was it? Um, and they wouldn't answer. And I thought, hmm, you know, you, you won't be giving the game away if you said, you know, oh, it's an unofficial kind of tip from, I don't know, an executive, but we can't give his name. You know, it's, they, they wouldn't even go that far. So I thought, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm a bit dubious about this. So it's it just seemed ethically right to me. So we kind of, you know, I kind of resigned from there for like and we decided to go different, um, different ways. Um, just prior to that, ironically, there was a what used to happen in Terror Rebels is you'd get people vying for power. So yeah. it wasn't unusual for somebody to change all the privileges on the GitHub so that somebody else became in charge of it. And then somebody else would manage to get them privileges back and then they'd throw the other person off and all this kind of stuff happened. And towards the end, there was um, a big problem with the kind of steering group um, and it all kind of fell apart really and i can remember ed at the time and there's a chap called maventus he was um, you know real honest honorable guy um they said to us you know why why don't you lead the terror rebels i said because i don't want to i said <laughs> i said i could do you know if people wanted me to but i said you know i'm not interested in it um and this is well that's why we think you'd be the best person for it 
um because you're the only one who doesn't seem to want the power um yeah. and i said well if you wanted me to i'd have to be voted in i said i'm not otherwise it you know it looks like there's a coup um and i thought well that won't happen because people didn't like or a lot of people didn't like how i spoke it's uh i'm not into this kind of moon boy language and stuff like that i'm into being technically accurate and making logical decisions and you know looking at the big looking at the long-term picture if you like um which you know didn't necessarily didn't necessarily kind of sit comfortably with you know many people there um but yeah so anyway um so that's how terra vita came about and that's how i came to came to leave them if you like so yeah so it's set up to uh, in the first instance really to provide a funding a funding platform for for terra rebels and that evolved into terra port finance yeah so when i left terra rebels um I was thinking, look, there's got to be a better way to this. You know, you need to have trust. Um, so I set about trying to get the community of people that had kind of started to follow us um, to have faith in what I had to say. And to do that, you've just got to be honest about everything and you've got to be truthful um, and you've got to work on facts rather than feelings. And some developers got in touch with me um, and they said, look, you know, you seem to be one of the few really serious people in Terra Classic. Um, and we want somebody to kind of work with. Um, and these guys uh, were Italian developers. Um, they didn't speak English as a native language. So that's, you know, something else that I guess um, made me appeal more to them. Um, and then Frag and a few others kind of got in touch with us as well and said, look, you know, it's uh, we like what you talk about and um, what your vision is. And we'd like to be part of that. Um, and we kind of stuck together pretty much, pretty much since. So it's, it's. I mean, they call me <laughs> the boss or the leader or things like this, or you know, um, which kind of makes me chuckle because I don't actually look at myself like that. Um, I have various ways of kind of describing it, but I kind of consider myself a bit like a plumber. Um, where there's a problem, I'll fix it. And if we need a new connection somewhere, I'll find the connection. I'll make sure, you know, it's piping in the right kind of information. Um, so, you know, it's, which is more like the classical, the classical value that a kind of director tends to give. You know, you tend to empower people beneath you, tend to help give them the resources um, and the, the guidance, if you like, to make the, to help them be the best that they can be. And I guess that's the role that I am. So I'm always looking for ways to improve things um and you know mm. to make them kind of connections and uh you know help the help the team progress so effectively you could say we're a bit like a and it's an overused term you could say we're, we're a bit like a dao um in terms of you know often it will be referred to me well what do you think you know rex um but ultimately it's down to the person that's tasked with that particular um aspect of the the team for them to deliver it you know they're empowered to make the decisions okay and if we if that person needs help from the rest of the team then you know the rest of the team kind of digs in if you like yeah. um so you know it works very well um so we you know we're really fortunate we've got some fantastic connections all over the community um i think generally speaking those that those within the community that can take a more mature look at what we're trying to deliver as a team tend to get on pretty well with us um you know we you'll never see us kind of tweet saying we're going to visit the moon to tomorrow and you know look to a dollar and stuff like this you know we tweet very factual things so that's my job know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you'll do it far better than me um <laughs> so for instance with teleport um you know as more projects come onto it you know we will uh, announce they're there maybe talk a little bit about them we won't necessarily promote them as such because that's for them to kind of take over that promotion however yeah, from a factual viewpoint yeah. yeah absolutely you know it's um unfortunately we can't vet every project that goes on terraport and um, just as binance you know um can't those that you know you know sit on the binance smart chain um but what we can do is we could make terraport as safe as what it could be um now I don't know if you're, you're familiar with this, but back in April last year, um, the team was hacked and Terraport had a lot of money stolen from it. Um, well, it wasn't really stolen from it. It was stolen from the liquidity providers, um, which is a very important point. So um, 
I think roughly at that time it was around about four million dollars of value that was that was stolen. And uh, we've done everything we can to get that back, and we're still pursuing ways to do that. But the biggest problem that we had is that when the attack happened, um, I was really fortunate um, that just the day before the hack, I'd connected with somebody that had got CZ as a connection. So when you know just by um serendipity if you like so a few hours later on i'd actually put some money into the liquidity pools myself and i was doing an analysis in terms of what the real returns were to see whether they actually checked what we said there was going to be um and you know i went to <laughs> went to remove my liquidity and it, everything went to zero and i thought sure i can't have done that um so i kind of you know rebooted the app and stuff and rebooted my computer and stuff i thought what's going on here and uh, got in touch with some of the devs and we soon became apparent that you know we'd been hacked um which was absolutely devastating fantastically devastating not just for the users but um you know my wallet was hacked about a month ago and i basically lost everything so mm. i i understand completely uh mine was in fact i had uh i was the vice president of a company the company closed and i didn't care because i have crypto I, it it didn't really matter to me, and uh, so I I wake up one morning and I get an alert, and this was by the way this somebody this has got to be somebody that that knew me, but that I got an alert that said that uh, my password you know had been used in Germany, presumably through a VPN, no matter what, uh, but it had been used in Germany. So I changed my password immediately, and then I went back to sleep because everything seemed to be fine. And the next thing I know, I woke up the next morning and I was making videos and. Uh, you know, I have partnerships with certain people, so I have obligations. So I'm doing a video for one of my people, and I'm like, I see the price has gone down, and I'm like, well, what idiot would sell right now? Like, this is the moment where you would be holding on for dear life. What kind of moron sells right now? And uh, when I hit the button, I looked down, it was me that sold, and I'm like, oh my god. Then I go to another crypto that I have. I haven't even looked at my wallet at this point. Uh, then I go cl and click on another crypto. And they're down too. And I'm like, wait a minute. And I look down and it's my wallet again. And then I go into my wallet and it's everything gone. And the important part was, look, it's just crypto at the end of the day. it's There's value to it. I can make that back. But for me, it was not having access to the stable coin that I had there. Mm -hmm. Like that stable coin is basically what I intended to live off of. And it was gone. So I understand how your heart sinks. I understand the depths of despair that you start to feel when all of the money just disappears and you have no idea what's going on yeah absolutely and i'm sorry to hear that it's um you'll not be the you'll not be the last person to have that as well it's uh, yeah. it's something that we face within our um community on a regular basis yeah. um you know people trying to hack wallets and, and all sorts of stuff um but yeah we've 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 been fortunate we've managed to help a lot of people out over the last couple of years and usually through kind of you know, uh, undelegations, kind of scams and things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's devastating. And uh, and yeah, so when when the hack kind of happened, um, was very fortunate. Within a few minutes, we managed to get through to CZ. Yeah, and he um, he kind of signed posters, and you know, I think he you know kind of helped out to some degree um, to kind of get things kind of blocked in some of the the sexes, um, which is something that we we'd done ourselves as well. Um, so, you know, I think it was KuCoin, Mex, um, KuCoin, Mex and Simple Swap. I think they was the, the big three at the time. Um, so there's a lot of speculation in, on Twitter that, you know, a lot of money gone to Binance and stuff, but it hadn't. It was Simple Swap. Um, however, um, what we decided to do, because I'd strategized in case we'd ever been hacked. So I'd worked out in advance what I'd do if this had occurred. Just because, like I say, risk management is what I do for a living. So I always think of the things that you don't want to happen. Um, and, you know, it, so my strategy was that if this, if a hack happened, let all the money get onto the sexes because you're not going to get off the blockchain. And if it goes onto a sex, then you've got a chance of actually getting it secured there. Um, and sexes have got a responsibility and they should know the people that they're dealing with in, in principle. Right. So that's you know we that's why we didn't tweet a lot about it we just you know kept quiet we thought let's wait till all the money goes off the chain and and we'd hope we'd got the agreement with the sexes that they wouldn't announce that they'd blocked these accounts 
so that they would get filled up and you know hopefully that the hackers would fill them up before they tried to take some money out that that was the the strategy um there's not a lot you can really do really is there however there's a few in the community decided that you know um that they'd seen seen the hack going on and they told you know um said that they'd inform you know a couple of the sexes and they, they just couldn't wait to tell the world you know you know what they'd done but it, it kind of it made things a lot more difficult for us and we, we got in touch with these people as well and we said you know please don't tweet this because all you're doing is telling the hackers what you've done which means they'll try another way um and you know so yeah they anyway they didn't follow our request um and one of those was um where you got rex and vegas they was the the biggest corporates there if you like but anyway you know um People tried to do different things, I guess. So we were aware on. of it, by the way. Like, well, you know, that was a big that was a big news thing <laughs> that the liquidity had disappeared, and mm. you know, I mean, and of course, you know, in in my position, in 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 our position, when we're you know we're out here, all we can go on is what we know, and what we know is what we've seen a hundred times before. Uh, and and to be fair, like you know, a lot of us just come from this token here. I remember Safe Moon. I mean Dave Portnoy yeah. is out here telling him telling everybody buy Safe Moon, buy Safe Moon. This is the greatest thing ever. I'm gonna put all my money in Safe Moon. The next thing you know, it absolutely rug pulls and was it <coughs> Kamadi Kam Kam or whatever his name is. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't even have enough money to pay for his attorney as of this morning. But you know the point is there are a lot of different tokens and cryptos out here that you know that happens, and that's because the developer or somebody on the development team has taken the money and they've split. It doesn't mean that the team is bad; it just means that there always seems to be a reason. So, you know, as soon as something like that happens, yeah. as soon as somebody broadcasts it, then you have a problem. You know, you have a PR problem that moment. Ab yeah, absolutely. Um, so we was we was perplexed how this had happened, um, and I kind of just outlined earlier on how our the structure of our team works, and our lead developer was the only person that had access to the GitHub. And you might think that seems odd, but the purpose was the less people have access to it, the less chance there is of anything going wrong. That was the theory, okay? Um, however, what had happened was the, sub, uh, the, the lead dev had subcontracted some work to another contractor, um, and he provided documentation he'd done, you know, that kind of doxed himself. And for about three or four months, this developer was working. Um, and providing some really good stuff. However, obviously, it would set a you know it set about um, kind of social engineering the lead dev. Um, you know, creating a it's a very long play um, to create that trust there. And then when the right opportunity arose, and we kind of struck. So what actually happened was there was about ten days after we launched, there was a slight slight irregularity in one of the liquidity pools. Um, yeah, our, our lead dev would be the best to describe it to you, but there's slight irregularity, and the lead dev picked up on it, and this contractor picked up on it. Um, obviously he'd been expecting it, so he said to the lead dev, he says, "Look, you know, I picked up, noticed this issue. I developed, a, you know, a patch for it, if you like." Um, and the lead dev looked at it and thought, "Yeah, you know, see exactly what's gone wrong here." Um, looked at the patch, looked at you know, um, what kind of been provided as the code and thought, okay, um, and slotted it in. So it looked to an investigator, it looked like the lead dev had kind of, you know, um, created the, the issue, if you like. However, hidden in some of the other code, there were some slight alterations, which meant that, that you know, the hacker could train the liquidity balls. Um, and was fortunate that the Binance provided us with a, a frenzy, a crypto frenzy specialist, if you like. And he helped us work out what had gone wrong. Um, and then he, he also worked out, in his opinion, um, who he thought the attackers were. And was told not to tell anybody about it because I think there was other um, uh, legal agencies that were working to track these hackers down. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, they, there was a massive team of hackers that got, we were told they'd got unlimited resources. You'll never catch them. You'll never get your money back. Um, and they're kind of beyond any kind of jurisdiction. Um, and I think, you, you know, from that description, you can work out who they probably were. Um, but, yeah, we was asked not to not to speak about it, um, which that made it kind of difficult because the community was, they was jumping to the conclusion that if we didn't say who it was, then it must be us. Right. Um, but, no, you know, we, we was asked not to mention it. So we honoured that, you know, Binance had helped us out. Um, and, you know, you've got to, be good to your word but it it made the journey back 
the journey of recovery harder. Um, and actually, we're still recovering these funds. So, yeah. um, as I said, you know, something that made it very difficult was that, I mean, I reported it to the police in the UK. They initially said they wasn't interested. Um, I then went to what you call action fraud in the UK. Um, and then they said that they wasn't interested. You need to go to your police department. I thought I've already been there. So I went back to the police department. They put me in touch with the economic crime department. Um, they said, we need a couple of days to look into it. I said, well, I'd rather, can you not issue like a letter to these sexes or something at the minute, just say freeze these funds? Um, I said, we've got an opportunity here to save a lot of money of people's you know, funds, if you like, or a large amount of people's funds. And what really interesting, two days later, the term said, yeah, it's out of the scope of our department. You need to go back to action fraud. So action fraud said they'll deal with, deal with within, I think, 30 days. And in the end, the term around said it's nothing really to do with us. Um, I thought, right. So I went to the head of the, the highest policeman in the country, in the UK, um, the head of the Metropolitan Police. I got in touch with him through LinkedIn. I got in touch with the chief uh, advisor for Interpol on cybersecurity. None of these people, you know, they said they was interested, but you had a couple of emails exchanged and that was that. Um, I got in touch with the Serious Fraud Office, National Cyber Security Agency, the Financial Conduct Authority, Financial Ombudsman, um, everybody could think of, and nobody had any interest at all. Um, that absolutely gobsmacked me. But one of the main reasons why they found it difficult was that Terraport didn't have the money stolen from them. Liquidity providers had the money stolen. And right. we pleaded with the community to report it to the police. Because from the police's point of view, if nobody reports a crime, then there's nothing to investigate. Um, and there's only myself and a couple of others that um, reported it. And literally, I, mean, I had about $100 worth in there. You know, I was doing an experiment. Um, so, you know, what I lost compared to, you know, some others was you know, chicken feet. Um, and, yeah, we offered, um, you know, bonus kind of bonus incentives, if you like, in terms of what might, you know, percentage of anything that might get refunded. And there was only one other person, really, that took an interest. And that was a guy from Norway. And he'd reported it to his place. And they actually went. I mean, he travelled all the way around Norway um, trying to get them to take it seriously. And in the end, one of them got in touch with KuCoin. And I think there was really struggling for resources for investigations. And effectively, they came to agreement with KuCoin that, well, it's probably the Terraport team anyway that's probably probably done the rug. So you'll just be giving the money back mm -hmm. to the ruggers. Um, and, <laughs> and I thought, you know what? You know, never once did they talk to me. You know, we can think, this, is, this is how you think in crypto. Like that's a, a symptom of a much larger problem lack of regulation really but it, it is a symptom here of you know one of those issues where you know I mean, we all you're guilty until proven innocent when it comes to crypto yes it looks that way doesn't it yep um you know I mean, i'm a professional guy it's the last thing i want is somebody to think that i'm not um right. and our team is like this as well you know we're really we're all you know just real honest ethical people um so you know it's yeah, it's, it's difficult. I mean, you know, for some time, you know, I was on, let's say, say suicide watch for our team. Um, you know, the, I mean, one of the, I mean, the lead dev in particular, I mean, each day I'd wake up and I think, I wonder if he's still here. You know, yeah. it really, I mean, it absolutely destroyed him. I mean, even now, you know, he's, he's very much, you know, traumatized by it. And um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. So, you know, one of the, one of the other um, kind of important kind of points here is that, we had actually aimed to get it all, um, to get Terraport um, certic audited before the hack. And by the way, they, even if it had been audited, it wouldn't have prevented the hack. Um, it was a different attack vector. Okay. Um, however, just because certic was so busy, it meant that we couldn't get it done before the launch. Um, we promised the community that we'd launch by a particular day. Um, and we'd also added a lot of packing in there in terms of spare capacity, just in case things run late. Um, but was also going to say it, was a, it can be a very hostile community at times to developers. And we was getting a massive amount of food from um, some kind of, well, if you like, YouTubers and, uh, you know, marketers, if you like, in terms of, you know, if you don't launch, you know, effectively it shows that you are scammers. Um, and we thought, what do we do? You know, if we don't launch, then it's, you know, is that going to threaten a successful launch in the future? I was mindful of people that, you know, had, um, bought in pre-sales and we wanted to 
you know, protect them because security isn't just about the code. Security is about how the project's launched and, and managed as well. Um, so we weighed everything up. And because the GitHub had been guarded so well, um, you know, we just thought that it was, a, you know, that it was a tolerable risk. Um, as it turned out, you know, well, I just said how it kind of how that kind of turned out. Anyway, we learned from it. Um, we're still looking to recover these funds now, by the way. Um, and, you know, I'll never stop doing that. Um, and actually, we're working with another um, police person at the minute. And we found another angle of how we might be able to get all the money back. Yeah. Um, so if we look, if our previous attempts had been we want the money back from the wallets, putting into the liquidity pool so we can refund everybody that had the, the money stolen. However, we're looking at it from a slightly different angle is that if you're a centralized exchange, then you've got duty to comply with anti-money laundering laws. Mm-hmm. And therefore, if you were, if you was told at the time that this is stolen money and you allow that to go through your exchange, then actually now you've got a duty that you should refund that. So yep. we're taking that approach now, which could mean that we get everything back. Um, so, f- so fingers crossed. Um, so that's that's the process we're working on at the minute. Simple swap, to be fair to them. Um, we provided them with all the evidence of the theft and they um, returned to us all the money that um, that they'd managed to freeze. Um, so, you know, that's... You know that, that was that was very welcome. Um, you know, it wasn't a massive amount, but it enabled us to kind of rebuild. Yeah, uh, which right. you know again uh, gave us another opportunity through an you know, increase in trading fees to return them uh, money to yeah. liquidity providers that way. And and you know, I don't know how many I don't know how many attacks there has been actually across the whole of the cryptoverse, if you like, um, where a decentralized exchange has actually managed to refund those that are been the subject of a hack, I mean, especially early on, but it's something that we we want to do. Um, it just seems the right thing to do, and that's right. what we're about. All right, so let's flash forward here, and let's uh, let's let's kind of uh, bring this to where do you think Luna Classic is right now? And for for me, for for my narrative, we've had some, and I know you probably don't want to talk about them because you're a validator yourself, but we've had what appears to a lot of us as investors as holders as people who are just watching this ecosystem we've seen a lot of these people that seem to vote in self-interest as opposed to the better interest of the investors and the blockchain at large so much so that it seems like they're trying to stifle not that there's incredible amounts of innovation happening every single day but they're seeming to stifle the opportunity for that. They're making it more difficult for people to come onto the chain. Um, I know I'm asking a lot here, all, all at once here. But we had the thing with Happy Caddy, which you, you, he was the first guy that you met. And you know, we have the issue here where you know Happy Caddy pointed out that one of the that that Moon Rabbit was being paid sixty thousand dollars. We don't know, by the way, if Moon Rabbit Inc. is the same as Moon Rabbit LLC, the validator. We don't know they're the same company. However, they both popped up around the same time. This was October, November of 2022, along with Bilbo Baggins, Major Futter, uh, Jebediah Shekelstein, Major Futter. You know, these are these are guys who were doxing uh, other validators that were doxing members of the community. Like there's a very sordid sort of affair, and you know, it turns out in a bankruptcy filing, they're paying something called Moon Rabbit. So. Weird sort of circumstances. The validators seem to be working against everybody. Um, here we are. What is this? This is February of 2024. You remember in the Terra Rebels, the first quarter of 2023, we were supposed to see a repeg. So here we are in February 2024. What do you think is going on with the chain? What do you think the path is to a repeg, if, if it can even be done? And in the event that all of that happens, the big question is, does Terraport Finance become the new anchor protocol that binds and holds this all together uh, as the funding agent, liquidity provider, lender solution for this entire ecosystem? There's a lot there to unpack in there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to say the answer is 42. Um, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and for um, anybody who hasn't seen that, that's the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So <laughs> make sure you go watch that or read the book. Please. Yeah, there we go. We're of a similar era, I think, can't we? Um, Let's unpack the first part. 
How do you feel about the validators? Are you comfortable with the current okay. selection of validators or should the investors really look at how the validators are voting and see how they would vote and, and okay. vote or, or delegate to who matches your conscience? Yeah, absolutely. So something that we do within our, um, uh, our kind of development group, if you like, is we encourage all our delegators to vote themselves. Okay. Um, for two reasons. One is it engages them. It helps them. It helps them. Helps give them an interest in politics on the chain. Therefore, that generates a incentive for them to want to learn. That makes education more easy. And therefore, what we tend to find with the type of projects and the uh, and how we're involved in the chain is we tend to appeal more to those that have a better understanding of cryptocurrency and stuff. So you know it's. So there's, there's multiple kind of elements there. Um, another practical point is that you can see on chain um, how people have voted compared to your vote as a validator. So although we um, do what we think is right, it doesn't necessarily follow that the delegators towards will necessarily agree. Um, however, we we do always try to vote with our conscience and do what's best best for the chain. Um, however. It's very easy for the community to be convinced by a certain rhetoric that something's deliverable that isn't. So, for instance, you know, th there's a massive burn narrative out there that, oh, if we increase the burn tax to one and a half percent, well, then we're going to go to the moon by next Friday. You know, it's unfortunately it's never going to happen. And, and people, in my opinion, are taking advantage of others. It's, um, you know, I, I don't think that's right at all. I don't think it's ethical in the slightest. However. We've got freedom of choice um, and there's freedom of opinion. And one person's bad actor is somebody else's freedom fighter. OK, so there is this view and there's, you know, there's videos and various things out there of, you know, people that are considered by some parties as being bad actors. I tend not to try to get involved in this because our team has set about trying to rescue Terra Classic and that needs builders. And whether you like the builders or not, a builder is a builder. Um, and that's got to bring some value if they actually do build something. If they say they're going to build something and they don't, well, it's maybe just leading people to the garden path. Um, but that's maybe a slightly different discussion. So in terms of validators, I certainly think that you should delegate with one that shares your political views. Um, I think you should look at how reliable they are. Um, with You mentioned about Moon Rabbit there. Um, well, when I looked in a Telegram group, um, I think it was the Terra Telegram group the just a couple of days ago. Chris Amani had said that Moon Rabbit Inc. and Moon Rabbit as a validator were different entities. And it's Terra Luna, thing. by the way, for, for those of you that are yeah. – it's Luna 2 that, that he's referring to. Yeah, sorry, Luna. What did I say? Uh, you went into the Terra uh, oh, Telegram. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so Luna 2. Um, that's how I kind of got – so I went into the Luna 2 Telegram, Chris Amani there, the – Chief Executive of TFL, and he, you know, stated himself um, that you know that they weren't related. Um, so you, go, you know, I mean, you can state whatever you like, can't you? But you know, that's what the guy said, and you know, to some extent, you've got to you know take the words as being honest, don't you? Um, I would say whether it's just a coincidence, I don't know. But either way, I mean, from my point of view, I've really not bothered how another group is funded. Um, if they can actually deliver something useful for the chain, great. That's great for everybody. Um, it's no concern of mine how they're funded, really. However, when you've got maybe entities that are spreading lies and fuds, I mean, we get a massive amount of it against our um, organisation. I mean, it's it's horrendous. It's 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 saddening to see as well. It's, you know, it's just so disappointing. I mean, I've never come across anything like this in any other working environment I've been into, but you know, this is the place we are. Um, but what's more sad is that you get people that follow these fudders and people that are talking with authority, even though they're based on very little facts. Um, so, for instance, I'll give you a real good example of this. Um, the Joint L1 Task Force, which is comprised of, um, you know, three or four developers, L1 developers, they submitted a proposal just a few weeks ago for a... Um, like a quarterly kind of roadmap for what they're going to deliver. I think it was sixty thousand in funding for their continued work. That's right. Yeah. Um, personally, I thought it was it was reasonable. Um, 
they what is unknown to a lot of people is that that team pays i think is it nine thousand i think it's nine thousand dollars a quarter to maintain the servers yeah. to deliver their work and the last quarter they paid for that out of their own pocket so if you say that two quarters comes to eighteen thousand then their upfront payment of twenty five thousand effectively covered the next quarter um so you know so looking at from one perspective i didn't think you know it was too bad um and also they they've always delivered um they might not have always delivered in the time frame they might have missed the odd thing off but they've always in the end gone and put it right um and they've took that professional approach i mean any professional out there will know that things don't always go to plan and you need a plan b you need a strategy but the professional that always delivers in the end is the one that tends to keep the customer um and keep the customer happy um although you'd prefer <laughs> You know to get everything right first time um so there was a lot of people spreading you know food about the joint l1 wow. task in, yep. in terms of saying they haven't done this they haven't done that i um i looked at a, a list that had been provided um so a list i gathered together a list of items that was claimed that the the task force had delivered and i got on a video call with vin um who was let's say the leader of the the task force and I said, right, I says, can we go through each of these individually and can you provide me with evidence that they've been done? And we spent two or three hours on this video call and he went through everything and everything was done. You know, he provided all the evidence. Um, I even went on to um, pass this on to, I think I posted it on our TG account, um, which is Terra, uh, Terra Vita community. Um, and I can remember passing it to all nodes as well. And, um, you know, to one or two of the validators that are, that made it clear that they was unsure whether they delivered or not. And I thought, well, you know, let's, let's help them, um, you know, spread that kind of evidence, if you like. And I invited people. I said, look, you know, you tell me what they haven't delivered and I'll go and find out whether they delivered it or not. If you, if you haven't got that contact and nobody could give me anything that they haven't delivered, but they'll still say now they haven't delivered, but they have done. So, you know, it's, um, so something, another issue there was that we'd got the, um, paper job proposal that had come out um, which had been accepted which was a good idea however in that proposal in the in the uh, documentation it specifically said this is for guidance and genuine labs who'd put a proposal up just uh, prior to that um, they'd not quite met all this guidance um, but they'd got their pro um, they'd got their proposal voted through so the l1 task force they'd put their proposal up and they didn't quite meet the guidance either maybe in a slightly different way um so i thought that there was a precedent that had been made that would allow um you know vin and the l1 task force to um, have their proposal accepted however you'd got alternative interpretations of the same guidance and this you know um i think was the other aspect that led to their proposal not being accepted so i, I think that there was some people would say these would be bad actors um from their perspective they'd probably say well you know i've got a very good reason for voting against these things um but i you know it it seemed to me that you've got people that kind of i don't know seem to put barriers in the way to progress for what for whatever the reasons are um i don't i don't know it's the most reasons you know most people have got reasons for everything they do haven't they <coughs> so Let's take it one step further and let's go with repeg. Where do you land on, because I like, I, I'm not a proponent of any type of burn that costs anything that's going to kill a chain no matter what I've come out. Um, you know, like we're not a tight knit community here on YouTube, by the way, I should point that out. I don't know or have relations with many of these other people that are part of any of these other chains uh, or, or any of these other conversation so there are people out here like matthew perry that are constantly pushing for burns there are people out here that just constantly tell you that you know we got to burn more tokens we got to do this and that um at your cost by the way like that's that's the part that they never revealed to you and i think it's disingenuous uh disingenuous for them to do that um but you know at your cost you want you just throw your tokens into the fire but what i do think is that a fee burning mechanism in which there is something created in a repeg has some fascinating implications. When I look at Luna originally pegged, I think it was, mm. I want to say before, before the collapse started, which was, I want to say April of 2022, it, it, 
um, but before the collapse from May of 20, something like that, um, or, or August of 2020 or September of 2020 until, uh, the collapse, it had burned from 1 billion tokens down to 330 million. So it had burned 66%. So I think a lot of mm -hmm. people are, have been excited about the opportunity to use some sort of repeg, which also, uh, I think one of the most recent proposals included something like a spread tax, uh, to originally peg Luna, uh, Terra, or let's call it USTC, I guess, at this point to two cents and then three cents and then four cents and then create a value. So that there was some back and forth. Where do you land on that? What do you think of the opportunity? And is there anybody that you know of really that's working on it? Is there something to this or are we all just as an, ex uh, are we kidding ourselves at this point or is there something working? Um, <clears throat> Okay, it's it's a very passionate subject, this, isn't it? Yes. Um, and I think it's um, it's the type of subject that very much divides the community. Many people would say that those that are sitting on the dream of the repeg, I'll call it a dream just for lack of other words a minute, um, are probably less informed than some that are maybe in another camp. However, as I said before, part of our goal within our group is that Terra Vita is set up to bring life to Terra, okay? Um, make it a lively place and bring sustained life. So that's what Terra Vita means, okay? So what we've what that does is it attracts people to our way of thinking, okay? So we've been really fortunate that we've got lots of people that we've connected with um, with some very diverse skill sets. And one of them is we've got a group of people that we're working very closely with on re-enabling market module. And it's the market module that allows the swap and burn mechanism between USTC and LUNC or anything else you want to set it up to. Yep. Um, and as part of that, we're looking to return the ecosystem back to the status that it was before the DPEG, if you like. Maybe not with the same amount of tokens, but in terms of as a working environment and working system. And I think this is the important thing. And, in, you know, when you, in your question, you highlight this really well. People need to understand what are the value, um, what are the elements of the Terra Classic ecosystem that are really valuable. And having a um, burn and mint mechanism is immensely valuable. And having a stable currency where it maybe isn't always 100% aligned to the dollar or the euro or whatever it may be, but it's stablish enough that if you get paid into it, paid for it, paid in that currency, that you know by the time you've got it into your local bank or whatever you want to do with it, maybe pay some employees or contributors, that it's going to be pretty much worth the same as what it was when you got it. And with a volatile currency, you can't really operate a business on a volatile currency. Um, I mean, like a validator, you know, if you withdraw your validator rewards, you know, within an hour, they could have gone down 35%. Um, <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's, it's just not, you know, uh, it just doesn't lend itself to creating a stable ecosystem. Okay. Financial ecosystem. So having a stable currency connected to Lunk, I think is really important. Um, I think there's lots of ways, or in theory, to get USTC to be worth a dollar. Now, there's some people say repeg in terms of, well, it's worth two cents. Well, let's make it worth two and a half cents and then three cents. And we'll gradually work its way up that way. Um, to do that is, and I think that's the basis of what the USTC repeg team was working on. However, um, I'm unsure what the progress of that was. I didn't, you know, I, I they used to tweet a lot and, you know, there'd, there'd be a reasonable amount of engagement with the community, but I didn't really see much of what they delivered. And I, I didn't, I think they'd work, I think they worked on some kind of test mechanisms and things like this. However, I got the impression that the sexes weren't really interested. Not at all. However, I, I don't think that they are. However, however um, since then, yeah. um, there's another opportunity that's arisen. And that since then, um, Terraport has relaunched and Terraport has been a decentralized exchange can swap and trade currency without a centralized exchange. And that brings in more opportunities. Okay. Um, so my personal view is I'm not, by the way, I'm not, 
um, the team that we've got working on this, we have a um, a kind of shared understanding, and that is we work on it, and we don't necessarily tweet about it and talk to the community about it because we're mindful that at some point there could be a government's proposal that we need to put up. And we need the community to make a decision on that based on facts and tests and data and all this kind of stuff, rather than what they've heard about on Twitter for the last three months. Right. Um, so that's why we took, you know, the, in terms of risk, of, if we manage to get um, put a process together, um, an approach together to peg USTC, get the market module up and running again so we can burn vast amounts of lunk without it taking it from, um, without taking the value out, if you like, then I think that is the way to go about it. However, if that means that we need the community to agree on a particular proposal, um, then it needs to be on the basis of the benefits of that proposal, if you like, let's say rather yeah. than what, um, what others have come up with. So the, um, so my personal view is, is that you could do this very easily. And this, um, this approach has been proposed many times. Like I say, I'm not going to say this is the, the approach that we're necessarily working on, you know, but was looking at lots of different things, um, different approaches. And one of them is simply um, do a reverse split. So if USTC is worth $2 or two cents, sorry, um, do a 50 to one split. Um, and then for every 50 USTC, you got you got one that's worth a dollar. Um, and then you can get the market module up and running again. And that will start burning a vast amount of lunk. And if you think that USTC really should be a stable currency, and actually lunk should be the uh, speculative one, then actually that lends itself to how the ecosystem was actually designed. Um, however, before you do anything like this, you've got to make sure you've got a thriving ecosystem as well. You've got to have demand for the currencies. Um, so it's not just as simple as turning something on and, you know, kind of hoping for the best. So so that's that's one approach. So um, let me let me interrupt here and say that that that's where a lot of people, um, I think, kind of I think there's a massive disagreement uh, fundamentally about you know when like 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 when you say a fifty to one split, what you're telling. I mean, what what there's a lot of speculative people here with voting power who are like, I absolutely do not want you to take um, mm. my for my two cent Terra. I don't want uh, you know if, if I have a fifty of them. I don't want you to just give me one back because I'm still at two cents. I think what, you know, would it be, um, and I don't, I mean, I don't speak to these teams, so I have no idea fundamentally uh, if it's at all possible. But in my mind, the way that this works is simplified. Uh, you go from in our systems here, in, in our ecosystems, not on centralized exchanges, you go in our ecosystem for the moment and we incentivize like you said we, you have to build i understand that but uh so every time you go from luna classic then you go to ustc that's your your stable and it's pegged to a specific amount and it's based on how much there is based based upon the available liquidity and it can eventually be moved up as we burn tokens but every time uh in the old process every time you bought ustc which was tear at the time every time you bought it was minted every time you sold it was destroyed but a portion of that was used to buy a little bit of luna and then it burned a little bit of luna every single time couldn't this also uh, be a reversal in which if you buy ustc you do not mint ustc you buy it from the pool um and then when you sell then a portion of what you sell is used both to burn some ustc along the way and then also a portion is used to buy Luna Classic and then burn that until we reach a level of stability with USTC. And then we can like flip that into whatever those fees were could then be used into burning purely the Luna Classic. Like th that to me seems like the thing that makes the most sense. I don't know how the compli how complicated that would be, yeah. but that seems like the logical step. Well, that's um, that's another option. Um, and that's something else we'd actually looked at um, as well. Um, so like I say I'm not going to say which one we're kind of falling on on the side of at the minute because we're going through kind of testing and stuff like that at the minute. Um, yeah, and there's, a, there's also a third option, isn't there? Um, and that's you create another USTC currency, yeah. um, USTC two, and maybe that burns Lunk and USTC. 
Um, it has to be two STC. It couldn't be USTC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But also, there's other stable currencies on the, on Terra as well, isn't there? So, yeah. for instance, you know, you could open one up for um, the euro if you like. Um, yeah. You know, I think there's a lot of people that are emotionally tied to the vision of a currency being worth a dollar. Well, the dollar isn't actually a pegged currency, is it? It fluctuates on a daily basis with other currencies around the world. So I don't really believe that there is any such thing as a stable currency. Um, I think it's a figment of imagination. Um, however, as a, as, a, as a goal, having a stablish currency that retains its value, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of value in that, let's say. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so there's a lot of things to think of there. Um, but I, I think something that you pointed out earlier on, which I think is absolutely vital, is that just because you're burning a currency doesn't mean you're adding value to it. Right. So something that we're involved with um, is Terra Casino. I don't, have you heard of Terra Casino? Yes, I have. So Terra Casino burns um, a lot of, of luck on the chain. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of what you need to burn to make a fantastic difference, it's a long way off that. Let's be realistic. However, for a, let's say, a utility that can burn long without you essentially being charged for it, um, i.e., you know, when people traditionally talk about burning lunk, they say, as you said earlier on, um, you know, you chuck 10% of your lunk away um, and then everybody's going to be better. But the person that's telling you this is probably keeping all theirs. Um, but with what, with what, how Terra Casino works is that if you play in the casino or bet or do trading or whatever it is that you do there and you treat it as entertainment um, and you think, okay, I'm going to have 50 pound in or $50 in the casino tonight. Um, I'm going to have some entertainment. If I come out with something great, if I don't, well, I've had some entertainment for the evening. A bit like going in the UK, like going to the pub. You don't expect to come home with more money than what you went with, but you hope to have had a good time. Um, you know, if somebody else buys all the rounds, then that's great. You might come out quits. Um, <laughs> quits with some stories, if you like. Um, so, and that's what the casino is built to do, built there to entertain. Okay. So you can use Bitcoin, you can use Ethereum, USDT, um, and various other coins. I mean, um, you'll soon be able to use Terra again in there. And what happens is that um, when you transfer money across the Terra Classic box, chain into the casino then that generates um fees from the burn tax so some gets burned that way however every time you place a bet 0.2 percent of that bet gets burned as well okay so if you're betting in bitcoin and you bet ten thousand dollars worth of bitcoin then 0.2 percent of that will actually be put to one side and then so much time later that will then be used to trade for lunk and then that lunk will be burned so that's adding value back into the ecosystem. Now, it's pretty much, other than Terraport, it's pretty much the only application that, um, that that I've seen that actually adds value to the ecosystem. If you're just purposely planning to burn somebody, a percentage of money that somebody's moved around, then actually you're not adding value back. And if you think of Lunk as being worth, I don't know, what was it? It's about 600 million now, something like that um 650 today yeah 650 so you know if it's if it's worth 650 million and let's say we managed to burn 10 percent of it let's let's not dwell too much on the maths or the you know the realities of it well let's just assume something happened we could burn 10 percent just now well you, now you've got a chain that's got um let's say instead of seven roughly seven trillion tokens you've got one that's got 6.3 trillion tokens well, that's great. So therefore, you know, we should all be better off. However, really, what you've had is one that has had seven trillion tokens that was worth 650 million. And now you've got something with 6.3 trillion tokens that's only worth 585 million, if my maths is right. So you get the picture anyway. Um, so actually, you've got the same amount of tokens that's worth the same amount of value. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you burn tokens that it's going to go up in value. You need to make sure that 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 the value of the chain is still worth 650 million, even though the tokens have reduced. So therefore, you have to create a um, a buyback and burn incentive, if you like. And I think the market model now we now we kind of just discussed it earlier. There, I think that does help 
help deliver that. Yeah. Um, so then the final question would be, do you see Terraport uh, becoming something of the anchor protocol? I mean, let's face it, the funding, the the lifeblood, anybody can argue what they thought Terra and Luna was, but this thing was run and funded through anchor protocol. Do you guys consider that perhaps you guys assume that position and that you become the lender that that makes the I mean, that's really that was really what turned this into such an attractive option. And that's really why so many people during a bear market, I might add, were still pumping the oh, this is the only token that was pumping during a bear market. Mm -hmm. um, and it was and it was the lending opportunity that was presented uh, by Anchor Protocol. So do you consider that, that that's where Terraport fits into the ecosystem or is there somebody else out there that, that, that does that and you guys have a different lane? Um, that's an interesting one. I don't think we'd be offering 20%, let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when, we, when we set up TerraVita, um, we did a lot of analysis and worked out what we thought the chain would need to, to thrive. And one element was to uh, enable money to come into the, the ecosystem, and um, a DEX was useful. Um, and Terraport Finance, <coughs> excuse me, is far more than a DEX. There's a lot more elements to it. And we just released a new roadmap as well. Um, and we're well on with that as well. So another part of that was that you need to enable builders to be able to build. They need to be able to get a leg up, and they need to be able to operate sustainably. If a builder can be sustainable, then he can build more things, okay? And also he can deliver service that's got a long-term potential and therefore you can grow. So sustainability is massively important. Um, so as part of that, Terraport has um, you know, a token factory um, and we're working on a launch pad at the minute, um, which is pretty pretty close to being done. Um, and this kind of helps with um, helps helps builders so that helps builders get into terra classic another problem that needs to be dealt with is the burn tax the burn tax despite what the community was told um has been a big barrier to many building on terra classic however it's not been insurmountable so terraport works well works with the burn tax um it would work without the burn tax as well you could just set the perimeter to zero um so it's not something that can't be overcome um but one of the other big problems of it other than the technical element is that you have to factor in um 0.5 percent into every transaction you do and that can mean the difference between something being viable as a um, application and not being viable okay so there's moves at the minute to change the burn tax to a tax to gas system yes. that could help another thing that we're looking at is enabling Terra Classic to be as easy to be built on as Ethereum, okay? Um, and that means getting documentation in place and also, you know, working on some software to enable that to be, uh, enable builders to be able to build a lot easier as well. Um, so it's about it's about removing all the barriers to building a thriving ecosystem. Like I say, we've got all the community here. We just need the shops being built. So let's help the shop builders build the shops, okay? Um, so... So in terms of Terraport and TerraVita's kind of role in this, that's what we're trying to do. We, we, we like to see that we'd like to consider that we're, we're helping facilitate growth. OK, that doesn't mean other people can't as well. And the more developers there are in Terra Classic, the better. I mean, I'm in talks with the two or three people at the minute um, setting up a team. We can call it whatever we like. You know, think of it as an onboarding team to help developers that are coming into the ecosystem to get over some of the you know, some of the issues to do with Terra Classic that maybe don't seem quite quite apparent. Um, and all these things are provided kind of free of charge because what makes, I think what makes our team, and, and some of the, there is some other teams like this stand out from some of maybe other well-known groups is we don't get payments from the community pool. We will never ask for a payment from the community pool. We're self-funded. What we're interested in is Terra Classic growing in value and lump growing in value. And when that grows to, you know, grows in value, then that's when we get our payday, if you like. Um, so, you know, we're putting our money where our mouth is. If we don't trust in what we're building, well, you know, maybe we need sponsorship from somebody else. But we believe in what we're building. And we believe that, you know, if you work hard, um, you know, you get the rewards for that. 
So, and this, like I say, it's another reason why we try to get on with everybody in the in the ecosystem. Um, you know, it's very easy to make enemies, but it's not always easy to you know, maintain kind of relationships and friends. And but the more you've got, the more people tend to get on, if you like. Yeah. Um, but in terms of a lending protocol, I mean, I think there's one out there that's been been worked on. I'm not going to say it's directly um, something we're focusing on just at, at this minute in our team. Um, yeah. We're working our way through our kind of roadmap. Um, but I think it'd be, I think it'd be something that would be attractive for the chain. I think if we're going to do that, we need to have a stable coin first. Um, now, whether that's USTC or you, you know two two CT, there's going to be a tongue twister, isn't there? Um, <laughs> two two USTC, <laughs> yeah, another one. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah. So, but all these things, I think, are I, th- I don't necessarily see them as problems. I see them as milestones that we just need to reach and get past. Um, and I think once people stop trying to get payouts from the community pool and work on what needs to be done, yeah, I think there'll be a lot more trust that returns to the chain. Um, if that then means that, let's say, lump goes up. Maybe to where it was before, as a as a previous high of what three zeros and a six, something like that. Or even yeah. if it's three zeros and probably a four or a five, then validator rewards would actually um, increase in value as well. Maybe not yeah. in terms of percentage, but in terms of the actual value that we're getting. That then helps make that more sustainable. Um, USTC uh, there as well. Um, you know that would in, that would have more of a um, a sustained value. Let's say. Um, so then you can start to run, you know, more traditional style organizations from it. Um, so, yeah, it's I, th- I think that's I think that's where kind of terribly to kind of sit. So it's, it's, there's a lot of things that we think of that I don't think others really get involved with. So, for instance, you know, we we've got arranged for a um, another kind of backup to the chain. You know, if yeah. all those infrastructure fails or or others, um, you know, we look at risk management, things like that. Um, like I say we've got a good relationship with. With TFL as well, in terms of you know various kind of employees that we we speak with, um, we've got connections with things like Axler Network, so we've got cross chain kind of pairing set up with there, you know, um, yeah, it's, there's there's a lot of groundwork that's been done um, by some fantastic people within our team, um, which you know I just you know I'm in awe of some of the things they can do. Um, they'll probably say the same thing about me, but you know I don't know what they're looking at. Um, but <laughs> but they're um, yeah they they're apps you know I, I've got to say I mean you know um, we're really lucky to have the people in the team we have um, and there's people in our team that others don't know about um, because we take security extremely seriously so what we do is we we KYC people that KYC people within our team that work alongside our team um, but help kind of deliver to the community um, because we want that security that. For instance, that you know the the blockchain is going to be functioning correctly, and um, and we just want to you know reduce every risk there is to a tolerable level. Um, so so another aspect there is you know we've got a working relationship with Certic, um, and the Certic have agreed with us should we want to do this to set up a um, Terra Classic specific um, KYC process, and that's yeah. something that's kind of in in the governance news at the minute, if you like. Um, you know some proposals are out that have the best possible intention but um maybe need refining a little bit let's put it that way all right well then i think that wraps it up um rex i i appreciate you for taking the time i know you got plenty of things that you could have been doing today um i think that the community really needs to hear this from people you know and i and, and look you're not the president of of luna classic i'm not the uh i'm not the pr guy for luna classic but people need to hear from validators people need to understand some of the underpinnings of what's really going on in this ecosystem, because the great part of decentralization is there's nobody in charge. And the bad part of decentralization is the same thing. Nobody's in charge. So you have no official website, you have no official communication platform. You have no, some people, sometimes you have no idea what's really happening in this ecosystem and nobody's really collating this information and presenting to people in a package that they can readily understand. We're all just kind of doing the best we can. So I appreciate you taking the time to give us some in-depth analysis of what's going on behind closed doors, how Terraport fits into this ecosystem, 
and you know at least an idea that there are people working on the things that we're passionate about i mean that i think is important so thank you so much for coming on you're welcome and um you know um and like i said one of the first things that we kind of you know spoke about was um that was the driving force that kind of got me into this to actually kind of reach out to developers in the first place you know um, appreciating that the community didn't realize what was actually going on if there was anything going on um so yeah I couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, for somebody like yourself as well, um, I think you're really important for the community because you're somebody that's independent as a, okay, you know, you've got your YouTube channel and your business. Um, but in terms of being separate from the governance, yeah. you're um, you're not swayed one way or the other. You can just deliver things how they are. You're not after delegations for your validator. You're after essentially the facts for your listeners. Well, classy, uh, classy crypto, Jesus, he, he's a, he, he was a friend of mine and I, I, I'm not going to say that he was corrupted by being in that position, but I felt it was a corruptible position. So at no point have I ever considered becoming a validator myself because it changes the way I look at things and I'd rather be on the outside looking in and reporting yes. as opposed to being involved in it. Yeah. It's an interesting one. Now, um, classy for a short while, um, uh, worked as part of our team um and his role was because I, I like classy he's got a lot of energy and yeah. for a young guy i mean he's very mature for his years um and he just yeah he brought in an element of kind of excitement to everything he did and i, I really like that but something that i thought was very important for the community was getting a consistent voice out there of how big the community really is yes so the trouble is is that most projects will promote themselves so within terra vita what we want to do is we want we want to promote the ecosystem so class's role within the ecosystem sorry within terra vita was to promote the ecosystem so he was we asked him to go around and find as many projects as possible and just promote them and you know every now and again maybe promote us but it's more about promoting those so he was actually um yes yeah, so, so that's that's what he was kind of employed to do and um, if you look at um, Frag, who's you know massively valuable with our team, he's tasked with a very similar role um, when he's not doing his L1 work, which is to support anybody in the community that needs help with with building. Um, so one was about the promotional element, the other's about the technical element, um, and you know Terraport's kind of living something in between um, because we ain't going to build our way out of you know this slump as individual teams. Yeah. We're going to build it out by being a lot of teams working on the same problem. Right. Well, then I think that uh, it's a fantastic opportunity. Everybody loves the uh, everybody loves the comeback story. Luna Classic so far has been it's it hasn't it's been it's been doing it's been happening in a bear market. But it is my firm belief that this is going to be one of the most epic comeback stories that you've seen in the face of crypto. And I'm just happy that we're all going to be part of it. Well. We are part of it, um, and I think as a comeback, I mean, let's face it, it's, last time I looked, we was in the top 100 coins on uh, CMC. Um, yes. We've gone down to zero. Like I say, I can remember sat at home watching eight zeros and having a cup of tea and thinking, now what happens? And then we've gone up to being worth $650 million. How many chains out there would like to be worth $650 million? But, and especially one that's actually dead, as a lot yeah. of people like to call us. Um, yep. So we're a dead chain that's worth six hundred and fifty million dollars. There's something that doesn't quite add up there, um, and of course we're not dead. We're we're thriving. We've just got a long way to go, um, and I think we're going to do it. I think so too. All right, guys, you heard it right here. So uh, if you want to check out Luna Classic, check it out. Make sure you go check out the Terra Token, uh, TerraPort.finance. If you are looking, I'll put the links in the description down below. And remember, this is not financial advice. My name's Bleeves. I am always right. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will talk to you again very, very soon.